This is something that I think you could see in your practice literally tomorrow morning, and I want you to treat it. This is something that has so much value for your patient because the reality is these teeth for this patient are getting damaged. And I think too many times as doctors, we're not paying attention to the problems that are in front of us. And instead, what's happening here is we're, we're telling the patient, oh, it doesn't make a huge difference whether you fix your teeth or not. And we're not approaching this with urgency. So let's talk about the case. So this patient presents in the hygiene chair and he's missing a lower first molar. He's been missing that tooth for a few months. He's obviously got crowding on his lower incisors and he's missing his second molars there too. He's got crowding on his upper incisors. In terms of our molar classification, he's biting in a nice class one occlusion. Now when we talk to him first about the missing tooth, he doesn't want to replace it. Honestly, his, his opinion is, he's like, I don't really care. It's been missing. What's the big deal? Then what's so cool about this case is gonna be the change in mindset after we go ahead and talk to him about his dental health. By the end of this case, he's now coming to us saying, I wanna fix that and I wanna put a tooth back in that position again. We, we kind of took a patient here who kind of felt meh about his teeth. And by the end of this case, we've turned him into a patient who truly cares about the oral health. But it started just from having a conversation about the chipping and damage and wear that's starting to happen on his incisor teeth. So the first thing that we talked to him about in the hygiene exam is just, did you know that you grind your teeth? To which he says, well, you know, I used to grind my teeth and right, I, I used to. And it's like, well, no, you're, you didn't used to. You currently are chipping and damaging your teeth, right? That right central incisor is getting worn down, the upper left lateral incisor, the two lower central incisors, the canines, kind of everything is getting worn down right now. Once we show him this, whether it's through an itero scan, which would be the best, or in this case, I just literally showed him with a mouth mirror. He just held it up and I pointed out all the chipping and he realized that there's issues and problems with his teeth. So that starts the conversation and we bring him in for a consult. At the consult then, we're able to go ahead and talk to him about the value of straightening these teeth. It's not gonna stop him from grinding, but it will prevent him from biting in an atypical position where he will cause so much damage to those teeth. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the ClinCheck because the patient, after a good explanation of the value of fixing his teeth, he understands now. And so he's willing to go ahead and start fixing these problems. So the first thing I want you to look at on this ClinCheck is the IPR that's there. Now there's IPR that's been put in on the upper and lower arch of 0.3 millimeters. So the first thing that I wanna ask you then is, do we need this? If you look at a patient's situation and you see that they're biting in a class one molar and a class one canine on both sides and you click on the tables here. So on the top right, there's the button tables, right? And so if you go right here to the Bolton analysis, right? And you click on that Bolton analysis, this is gonna pull up a table for us. And on that table then it's gonna tell us right here, the 0.77, is there a discrepancy between how his top teeth and his bottom teeth fit together as an arch. We don't get the full analysis because he's missing a molar, but he doesn't have a significant a bolt in discrepancy. So the lid and the box fit well. Now, what number would this have to be for us to say that it does not fit well? That number would have to be probably about two millimeters or more that we'd have to say, okay, we've got to do something if this patient is biting in class one occlusion. If this patient has a giant class two bite, Let's say I had a patient like this not too long ago. He's got a 10 millimeter overjet. Honestly, who cares how the lid and the box fit together because his top jaw is so far in front of his bottom jaw. Unless he's doing surgery, we're not gonna go in there and do IPR or leave spaces for veneers un unless it was an aesthetic concern. So in reality here, this, this is not something that's concerning with the Bolton. But well then why is there so much IPR, right? We don't need that much IPR there, but there still is lots of IPR. In this situation here, what I would look to is I would look to his photos and say, okay, well, does he have an issue right now with fragile tissue on his lower incisors? If we expand these teeth and bring them into alignment, are we expecting that we're gonna see recession? In my opinion, not really, because we've got great tissue here to the buckle of those lower incisors. It's nice and thick biotype. So I don't have a lot of worry right now that we're gonna be seeing recession if we expand this arch. So I'll tell you right now, we actually did not remove the IPR from this plan. In part, this was actually kind of a unique plan that we were looking to work it up with digital smile design. And so there was parameters that were actually locked in place 
in order to have the teeth where they considered them to be the most ideal, and that involved doing all of this IPR. So this was not actually planned by us. Uh, it, was, it was put in place from that plan. But if I was to treat this case again, I would certainly remove all that IPR because we don't need it for the Bolton analysis, I should say Bolton discrepancy, and we don't need it for the fragile tissues. Now, one thing that is important though, in my opinion, is if you're doing IPR, we should look to do that IPR all at the same time. I find it extremely inefficient to do that IPR at multiple stages. So if we're doing IPR, I would like to derotate those teeth so that when we're doing the IPR, we're actually doing it between the contacts of the teeth at the interproximal and not doing it so much on the buccal or the lingual of a tooth. Because if you were doing IPR right now at stage one on these teeth, you're gonna end up doing it pretty much right here on the buccal of that lower uh, lateral and more on the lingual of the central. So we wanna make sure that we're doing that IPR on the right spot if we're doing it, and that means derotating the teeth first before that IPR actually occurs. Now this is something that you have control of. You can ask the technicians to do this in the comment section. You would simply ask something along the lines of, please derotate the teeth before doing the IPR. And when you do the IPR, ensure that it's all done at the exact same aligner. Because there's nothing that I actually hate more about a ClinCheck than needing to come back five different times to do IPR. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at other aspects of the case now. So one thing that I'm always gonna look at is, do we have a deep bite? If we have a deep bite, it's gonna make things a lot more complicated. Well, we're about 50% in terms of a deep bite. If we look from the side view, we can see that the occlusion is pretty flat. So we don't have a significant step up with those lower incisors. So as we derotate these teeth and bring them into alignment, it's not like we need to intrude these teeth a significant, significant amount. But we do wanna have some intrusion because we wanna leave space for the restorative treatment at the end. So pretty much we just have general derotation of the upper and lower teeth. Let's take a look at the attachments. All right, now the first thing that I would say is whenever you have movements on lateral incisors, my recommendation would be to have attachments of some kind on the lateral incisors. The reason is, is that lateral incisors are the smallest upper teeth in the mouth and they're very slippery. And so it's quite hard for the trays to lock in properly and allow the movements to occur. Now in reality, I would actually plan to do the attachments slightly different than what they're currently situated right now. But for the most part, as long as you have a compliant patient and you've got an attachment of some kind on those lateral incisors, they're generally gonna track and move pretty well. Lower incisors, unless there's significant root movement needed in the mesial or distal, generally aren't gonna require a lot of attachments. So for the most part, this is a pretty stock treatment plan. We've got conventional attachments that Align has put in place. We've added a few conventional attachments in different areas. If we did need to intrude those lower premolar or lower incisors, one thing that I would definitely change on this plan is I would look to have an attachment going on on the lower uh, premolars that would be like a three or a four millimeter horizontal attachment. I want you to really be familiar with how to take control of ClinChex yourself. It's so, so, so important. So let me just do this. I wanna show you, show you all this right now. Okay, so this is right above what you can see on the screen. So on this section right here, clearly next level. If you click on this and then you go to my presentation cases, you can share, you can create a case out of whichever case you're on and you can share it with your patients. You can also use it for practice. So I'm gonna go ahead and I've actually created a demo case here. And once it loads, when we click modify treatment plan on the top right, it's gonna allow us to modify a demo case. This case, you can't see it on the top here, but it just says team. It's just a demo case. And this is showing the final stage because the treatment is pretty much done. But if you're not changing out attachments right now and don't know how to make the movements occur, it's something that I think is worth investing the time to find out. And we teach this, we teach this in our courses. We're teaching this in California at the end of this month, both in Los Angeles and San Francisco. How do you go ahead and make decisions on which attachments you should change out for conventional attachments or for optimized attachments to take control of your ClinCheck? But both by moving the attachments around as well as changing the tooth position, this is just such a crucial and, and easy step once you know how to do it. So on those lower premolars in our current case, if we had to fix a deep bite, all we would go ahead and do is we could either grab the optimized attachments and go ahead and put something on like an optimized retention attachment for deep bite, or we can go ahead and just drag a four, three to four millimeter. We can change the size attachment on that tooth. We can change the orientation of it. We can, we can kind of do all this stuff. 
So when I say take control and change the attachment for something else, this is what I mean. But for the most part, again, a case like this without a significant, significant deep bite with a flat curve as B, class one molar, class one canine and wear on the teeth, this is something that you guys should be treating in clinic all day long. One thing I want you to pay attention to, you'll notice it on kind of most of the cases that I teach, is to have what's called passive aligners. So if you look at the screen down here on the bottom right now, if I hover here, you're gonna see that it says upper arch active aligners, lower arch passive aligners. What this is, is we've just asked the technician to give us four. In this case, we were once upon a time able to get five, but now we can only get four of them. But passive aligners, what these are is these last four trays are identical to one another. There's no changes or movements that happen. So this gives the patient something to wear while we're getting a new batch of aligners at the end of this set. Now, in some cases, you might ask, so here's a tip. This is a pretty good one. <laughs> so pay attention for this one. Here's a good tip for you. When you're sometimes asking the technicians and, and you can write them in the chat, right? You can write to them here and say, please give me four passive aligners. So if you're asking them for four passive aligners and they come back and they say, we cannot give you passive aligners, it is impossible. It cannot be done. Well, then what you need to write in the chat to the technicians is please give me four nearly passive aligners at the end of active treatment. Please give me four nearly passive aligners at the end of active treatment. They will give you essentially four trays that have the teeniest amount of movement on them. This allows you then to have trays for the patient to wear while you're getting the new aligners in their next refinement. Because the number of times that previously I've ordered the trays and the patients lost their last aligner that they've been in, or you get to the end of a month of waiting for the new trays to come in and it's disgusting and it's gross and the patient is not loving their treatment, this is something that I do now on every single case. Okay, the other thing that I notice is that the movements, and this one takes a little bit of skill, just to have experience with ClinChex, but I notice that 41 aligners is a lot of aligners for the amount of movement we're doing here. I don't know that it necessarily needs to take that long. So what I've told the technicians then in my instructions is actually on the bottom here, this is treatment plan one with 40 one active aligners and five pa four passive. In a treatment plan number two, I just asked them, please increase the velocity to speed things up to be 30 aligners because I felt like the movements were taking longer than they needed to, to actually get from point A to point B. Okay, so this is the treatment plan for, for our first treatment plan. And this is what we get back, right? We can see that we have decent alignment on our lowers. Our uppers still need a little bit of movement on them. Now, one thing that I did differently in the past because I wanna show you some of these older cases too, I did take off the attachments for this patient. I took them off at every appointment. Every time we finished a batch of aligners, I took off all of the attachments and we'd put on all new ones again. Now you're gonna see in the more recent cases that I don't do that. I leave the attachments on as long as I know that they're the right attachments and then I'll take them off on the ClinCheck and put new ones on on the actual ClinCheck. Because if I can leave some of the attachments that don't need to come off and go back on, it's gonna be way more efficient. But in this case here, we've taken them off and there's still a very small amount of rotation that's needed on those centrals and laterals. And so we've actually gone ahead and planned that in this last revision here, because there's only two rounds of trays, we've actually planned this movement without, significant atta without any attachments on the teeth, just the minor amount of rotation. Now patients, if they're gonna be in this situation where they're, we're making very minor movements happen without any attachments on, they need to know how important it is to wear their trays perfectly. There's no room for error here. So he has to be perfect if we expect those movements to happen. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at where we were at after that first round. Here's his photos. He's got lots of staining on his lowers. A Little bit of movement needed on his upper laterals and centrals just to finish that rotation. And so here's where we're at at the end of his second round of aligners. Again, pretty straightforward case. Something that I think all of you could handle tomorrow in your practices. Essentially, most of the attachments as delivered by a line, a few changes on the lateral incisors to try and ensure better tracking, derotation, the lower incisors. We can see, unfortunately, our picture is a little bit out of frame or a little bit blurry, but we still have that chipping and wear. So at this point, we go ahead and do some whitening and then some buildups on his incisal edges. So those buildups are just gonna build back the symmetry on those centrals. And now when this patient bites, he's not biting on his enamel and wearing those down. A common question I get asked all the time when we talk about restorative combined treatment plans is, if you do this, these, this bonding and these fillings, am I going to need it done again in the future at any point? Or am I good for life? And what I tell patients is no, of course, you've ground and worn down your teeth to this extent already. 
there's going to continue being more grinding and wear. But what we've done differently is we've put your teeth into the proper position. So instead of biting unevenly on them and damaging them unevenly, if you do have grinding and wear while you're functioning and throughout the day, it's gonna be even across all of your teeth. It's not just gonna be biting on one or two specific teeth. But the good thing is at nighttime, we're gonna have you wearing retainers and that's gonna help protect your teeth and keep them nice and straight. So by putting them in the right spot, if you do grind and wear, at least if you chip a tooth, you're not chipping the enamel. You're not damaging your tooth further. It's gonna be a filling and that can be fixed. And if you do wear down um, your, your teeth and it's not chipped and worn, right, we can always build that back up again. And we can always go ahead and ensure that if you are grinding through your retainers, we can get you a night guard. The reality is though, the Vivera retainers are so good that probably only in maybe, I don't know, one out of a hundred cases do I actually need to replace that with a true splint. So for the most part, Vivera retainers are gonna do an awesome job of protecting those teeth. So again, basic case, what did we really focus on? Uh, we focused on aligning the teeth. We made sure that uh, we weren't having too many aligners in this batch. We made sure we had the passive aligners to hold them over. And we uh, got the teeth in the right spot, did the whitening. And uh, at the end, the ironic thing is, from a patient who did not have any desire to do a implant on that tooth to the, the position that they're in at the very end, he went ahead and he actually got his implant done. So the value of putting the teeth in the right spot is uh, such an important thing.